un prieten bun din Israel, așa cum spunea familia lui, provine din Șimleu Silvaniei. Astăzi a revenit la Șimleu cu o prezentare despre arborele genealogic, dacă pot să-i spun așa, despre, activita despre activitatea și uh, istoria familiei sale. Ok, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for uh, having you here today. Uh, I'm, I'm really appreciating it. For me, it's a very important day, not only because it's the Memorial Day, the International Memorial Day, but also because it's uh, privately, it's for me like a closing a loop. So, I would like, um, first of all, to start and say thank you very much for you. Uh, thank you very much for the mayor, for the vice mayor, for all the people that are hosting us today. Actually, it's my second time here in Shindok. I was here in 2012 with my friend, really. And uh, at that time, the synagogue was not yet prepared. It was under construction. Uh, but now it's the second time, and uh, I was very much excited to see the, the synagogue uh, today. Uh, rebuilt and uh, the, the ceremony, the, yeah, the ceremony in the morning, and now we have the lecture. So let's start because we don't have too much time and we have a lot of material. I try to do it a little bit more interactive, okay? So it will not be uh, boring. The story is about a Jew called, actually, Rabbi Moses Moshe in Hungary, it was more. That was his name, Polax, and the story is about his letter. What I start uh, and say to each and every uh, person here, when I say Holocaust, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Just like, you know, to fire. So, who wants to be brave? And just let's do one minute, even less, 30 seconds of trying to say, what does Holocaust remind you? Okay? Go. Don't be ashamed. Everything, every word. Sorry? Auschwitz. Auschwitz. Good. Another word. Not good, but uh, okay. The answer is. No, good. no, not good. The answer is good. Okay. Another word that reminds you of uh, Holocaust. Or, or comes to your mind. Jewels. Jewels. Death. 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 More. People. Sorry? Many people. Pain. Pain. She said pain. Pain. Great. And we have many, many more. So when I do this lecture, whether it's by, uh, to be to, to sixth grade students, high school students, university students, adults like you, or in companies, business companies in Israel, they say all these words. You can find some of them here, some of what you said here, and you can find many, many more. Okay? But most of the people, I have only one time, a uh, pupil, sixth grade, like this, told, told me, Holocaust <coughs> reminded me that I need to have a memory. And this is the reason, one of the reasons, Everyone spoke today in the morning. This is one of the reasons that I do what I do, and I stand in front of people and speak about my family story. Actually, it's my story. I call it like this, my story. I was not a Holocaust survivor, but it's my story. And through this story, I try to explain what happened, and also how we can research, and I'm not a professor like Professor Lurev that we have here. I'm a simple people simple person, but how can we find more and more data and bringing them together in order to find what happened? So let's start. My story actually starts here, here in Chino Tsunami, or as my grandmother called it, Sila Chonga. My grandmother <coughs> is here. This is her picture. She was born here in 1918 and she was died in Jerusalem, Israel, five years ago, in February 2011. Um, 
she is my she is the mother of my father and uh, she was called her Clara or in the Jewish name Perel uh, Weiss so that was the name of the family here um, what I sh show you here is actually the Jewish the Jewish community book every and each Jewish community whether it's in Romania, Hungary, and other countries in Europe, kept a separated book for everyone born or dying. And this is the book, a picture of the book, and this is the record. This is the record uh, of my uh, my grandmother. I know probably you cannot see, but it's for. And thanks actually to a family. Because Heinrich, who you guys here, is from the Heinrich family, so his great great father probably had his book and printed his book for the community. Uh, if we go back to the main presentation, sorry, sorry, um, she was an Auschwitz camp survivor. Um, actually, it's very important. It's very amazing. She's living in the north of Israel. I didn't know about her anything. She just wrote in her testimony in 2013 that uh, she was born in Shinau. Her father was a baker. So we had a sh bakery shop here in Shinau. And she was learning tailoring, tailoring clothes with my grandmother. So I called her and she actually gave me the full route, the full journey of what they both together. Her name was Bessie Videl. And they both together did all the journey together from the ghetto here in Chuk to Auschwitz to Zelbetzel, which is a factory in Germany, and then to Birkenbelt. The American has released them, I think the American has released them in Birkenbelt. And from that point she coming, she is coming back to Shinau Silvani. She comes back here. There were twelve sister and brothers and two parents only four left only four left so she came with three sisters and her brother was surviving but he was from Oradea, not Val. at the end and see how how fun uh, she she went uh, to israel and settled in petah and i mentioned it because also i myself from Petr Tikva, and I know Shino, Sivani, and Petr Tikva are twin cities. She spent, when she was in Auschwitz, she spent three weeks in Mengele's, famous Dr. Mengele's hospital, because she, she became ill. She has something, uh, and she became ill. <coughs> three weeks without any clothes, naked like a person born and after three weeks something amazing happened the lady that you see in the left side of the slide which was very young nice handsome but cruel lady with the name of Imra uh, Grizzly she was the number two the deputy of Mengele she was fighting this day, this, on the same day she, she was fighting with Mengele, and they have some like ego fight. She decided to take few girls from this uh, hospital and ask them to go back to the lager that all the Hungarians' friends were. And as far as I know, it was what, what, what the researchers called C lager and block number 18. She went back then, and that's the way her life was saved. But the story that I'm going to tell you is not about my grandmother and Shino Silvani. It's more about Mr. Moshe or Rabbi Moshe Pollock. So let's understand, and I know it's difficult to read from there. I will try to help. 
let's understand the tree of my family, which is relevant to this story. We are going to speak. We are going to speak about this man in the right side. This is Rabbi Moshe Polak, or as I told you, more Polak. This is my grandfather, called Julius Yuda Polak. My grandfather was married to a lady from Bergzas. He had two children. The three of them were murdered in Auschwitz. So when he came back after the Holocaust, he was married with my grandmother from Shino. Both of them moved to Oredia. Then my father, Itzhak Polak, was born in Oredia. And he was living in Oredia until 40 years old. So around 1950. And of course, this is myself. And this is my father's brother. Between the two of them, there is a difference of 11 years. The reason is very simple. Uh, my grandmother has six times failure uh, in order to get pregnant. Six times. Uh, and then all that is after she spent six months in Bucharest after the war, six months on a bed in order to stretch stretch the back because of what mentally did for her. So this is the tree, and as I said, we were going to speak about him. And whenever you see here a symbol of a candle, this means that the person was murdered in Auschwitz. So what's so special with this Moshe Polak? Moshe Polak was born in early 90, in, or in Aurelia. He was married and he had three children. Uh, and he was the, uh, the deputy rabbi of a very <coughs> ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Aurelia. And I will show you later on uh, a picture about it. So, um, he was murdered in Auschwitz uh, on the 13th of May, 2044. And what is amazing, he left for us a letter. But in order to explain it, let me say another sentence. When my grandmother died, we, Jewish people, and I think also other people, are having comforting days. So the Jewish have seven comforting days after someone is dying. So my father and my grand, uh, uh, sorry, my father and my uncle sat in Jerusalem and many people came to visit them, comforting them. Then my uh, uncle just went to the, to the uh, desk, took out a postcard like this, and told me, you have to see this. When I looked at this, it was an invitation for a wedding that sent from here, Shimon Silvani, to Jerusalem. One of the daughter, or one of my grandmother's sister, was married in 1930. So the postcard was sent from here to Jerusalem. And I told him, you know, this is historical document. So he told me, yeah, I agree with you, but I don't know if this is the real story document. I would like to show you something else. So he went again to the desk, took out a piece of paper like this, that were, were like this. So it was a copy of uh, paper. And he gave me to see it. He said, please. And it was looked like this. Sorry. It was looked like this. This is a picture of this letter. And if I make it a little bit more bigger. You can see it's very difficult even for the people who knows to read Hebrew. It is very difficult to read. I took it to me on my hand. And I started to say, OK, what is written here? Um, I understand a little bit. But it's very, very difficult. Very difficult. So what I did, I took the letter, I gave it to my uh, father's friend, who is a very, uh, very ex ex expert in uh, 
Gothic, so German language, one of them, and I asked him to translate this letter. And he really did translate this letter. So I would like to read with you the letter and to show you some aspect of this letter. First of all, the letter was divided into two. This section was written in a language we, the Jewish people, call Yiddish. Who knows what is Yiddish? Okay, let me explain. When a Jew people come from Romania, or Hungary, or Poland, or Italy, or Greece, or England, and need to speak with another Jew, well, not in Israel, so let's say in the old days, they couldn't know one each other's language. So around the 11th century, this language, which is called Yiddish, was created, and it's half German, half English. So a mixture of German and English, and many, many Jews know to speak this language. Or when a Jew came from Romania to England or whatever, he could speak with his friend or with his family something. OK? Now, Mr. Moshe Polak write, uh, write the letter here in Yiddish, and here, only this section in Hebrew. Does any one of you has a clue? Why did he do, why did he do and write the letter like this? Before we go and dive into the letter, any clue? So no one can know because Mr. Moshe Pola is already upstairs. He's not living. But what I thought, what I thought when I read, when I look at it first time, I thought there is a psychology of a person who really afraid for his life. Now, in the first section, he describing what happening in the ghetto of Moravia. This is something very known. Everyone knows. The German knows. The Hungarian knows. Not a secret. But in the second one, he write, who is he? And therefore, he want to speak Hebrew, <coughs> which is a language most of the Jews there didn't know. Only the very orthodox. Jews or the very Zionist groups. So you write it probably in Hebrew. That's my philosophy. That's my thought for this. Now, uh, let's go and I will be uh, very, uh, uh, I will be very uh, emphasizing on, on the places that are uh, marked. So uh, first of all, you write a, you write a letter in uh, Gross Verdine. Does any, when I started to learn this, Subject, I understood that each, almost each city in Transylvania has three names, at least for the Jewish people. One in German, one in Hungarian, one in Romanian. So, Oradea, Notvavod, and Grosvedai. Okay, for example, Shimlo Silvani, Sila Chomio, and for the Jews, Shimloya. That was the name of the city. So, he wrote it in the ghetto. When does he write it? Two days before Shavuot. Shavuot is one of our holidays, Jewish holidays. So let me just show you the calendar. So you will be near the calendar. Don't fret from the Hebrew. Uh, we are speaking about May 1944. He writes the letter. He writes the letter here. OK? We'll speak later on what happens here. But you write the letter here. They were deported here. And they arrived to Auschwitz on the 30th and were murdered. Fast and speedily to the gas chambers. <coughs> um, when he speaks about the ghetto, in a red, in a, oh, sorry. Maybe I, I leave this uh, microphone. Here. When he speaks about the ghetto, I just want to describe the ghetto. And this is, by the way, thanks to Amy, Emilia Tesla, who were here in the morning. Uh, this is the real draft of the Germans regarding Oregia ghetto. So you can see this is very similar to this. There were two ghettos in Oregia. One for the suburbans, to the villages around, surrounding Oregia. The other one is for the city. In this ghetto, 20,000 people were 
brought into the ghetto. Already at those times, we were uh, at a city of uh, 100,000 people. 30,000 people were Jews. 10,000 people of those Jews were men, young men, who were deported, not deported, who were moved to what we call munkatabos, or camps, working camps in the Hungarian army. And they moved. So we only left with 20,000 people in the ghetto. This is the ghetto. Now one question for you. Guess how many people do you think left in the last day of the transportation to Auschwitz in this ghetto? Okay, go. Go for it. How many people left in this ghetto? I'm not speaking about this one, about this one. How many people left on the last transportation day to Auschwitz? Go. How much? Don't be shamed. How many people left? No one. No one? 40,000. Not good. 40,000. How much? 40,000, the mayor. Mayor say 40,000. 2,000. 2,000, says. 100. 100, who says? Who says 100? 100. Guys, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Only 24 people left. Why? 80, 18, 1, 8 people. 18 people were healing people, sick with a disease called typhus, which the German didn't want to bring them to the trains to Auschwitz because they can, can be affected from this disease. And another six people, which were assigned to uh, one of their well, one of the campaigns, I would say, uh, of uh, saving Jews, uh, and the campaign was called the Kastner, Israel Kastner train from Budapest. So six people, six people were left. The department, but six people left, and together 24 people. Imagine 20,000 people squeezing in the rooms, and then only 24, okay. What I show you also here, what you can see here, is the place. This is the great synagogue of uh, or, uh, Oradia. This is the small synagogue of Oradia. This is what we call the Ulman Palace, or in Hungary, the Ulman Protocol. A very famous, everything is here in the center of the Jewish community. And we'll speak later about those places. So let me continue because the time is leaving. <coughs> um, I just can say that, because uh, that is uh, what I did when I found again, and I have the translation, I tried to see that what he's writing is true. So at least to see and match it with other, uh, let's say, written things. Formal written things, maybe from the Yad Vashem Institute in Israel. So when he said uh, we were deported between, uh, we were uh, entering the ghetto between uh, uh, 4th and uh, 10th Mai, Yad Vashem says 6 and 9. So it's very close. 4, 10, 6 and 9. Very close. And, and one more thing and more thing. Uh, but what he says in the 24, so two days before he writing this letter, in 24 May, they told us that we are traveling from here in a closed trailer scattered with 70, 80s in each trailer. So actually, my grandmother told me we were naive. We think everything would be okay. This person was not naive. Now look one more thing. He says, and I told you he speaks about the letter. I told you he speaks about the letter. But look what he's writing. He's writing this book may reach to a Jewish hands, therefore I'm writing these lines. I call this letter a letter of will. At the end of the letter, he writes that everyone who here okay, tell everyone about the things, 
plays revenge. So he knew exactly what going to be. He asked for the next generation to have a letter of the will. And again, why does he say this book? And the reason is very, well, I found it later on. The reason is the following. He didn't write a letter. He wrote it. He went into the small synagogue that I showed you before. He opened uh, one of the Jewish books, this side. Every book in the world, when you open it, has probably white or yellow pages, right? So he took advantage of this white page, and he just written everything in the book. He closed the book, he put it again in the library of the synagogue. Only after the war, one of the Jewish people of this community, of the community, came and started to make order in the synagogue and found this letter. And when he saw this clue, look what he's writing. I don't want to write my name, but with a clue, I was rubbing in the synagogue, and my name is Moshe. So he, wrote, he read it and said, I know this person. This was our rabbi. He went to my grand grandfather and his brother. That were they were saved from from the Holocaust, uh, and told them, you see, you have here a letter from you, from your brother. Please take it. Um, so this is the letter, and I will stop here because I have only five minutes. Where is that? Letter? <laughs> yeah, maybe I have more. And then all what I'm telling you now, this story, was taking place in 2011. Around, around the time that my grandmother was dying, was passed away. One year afterwards, so February 2012, one night in Petah Tikva, in my bed, with my laptop, I don't know why, don't ask me, but this is the this story, I decided that I need to search for something. For what? I don't know. But I said, let's start maybe from a testimony pages in Yad Vashem. And I did a search. I know it's a little bit tiny. I will <coughs> this is a letter, sorry, this is a testimony page that Moshe Spolak's sister wrote in 1956 in Jerusalem. And she wrote it for the memory of Moshe Polak. And she said, Polak, Moshe, and I told you more, not valid, and he went to Auschwitz, and he has a, he has a wife called Sarah Levinger. And I said, I never heard about this Sarah Levinger. Maybe let's have a research, some research about this Sarah Levinger. So, 1.30 a.m. in my bed, I'm just doing the search, and I find this one. And this one, were written in, I know it's Hebrew, again I will help. Were written in 88, only in 88. In a place in Israel, center of Israel, called Chadeva. The name of the lady that writes this is Bracha Peretz. Actually, the original name was Fritz. And she said, I had a sister with the name Polak Sarah. Before the war, she was living, before she married, she was living here. And she was murdered in Auschwitz, and also she's from Montbarak. And I say, I have a match. But if you look at those two people, Moshe and Sarah, both of them are very old people, considering. One born in 1800, the other one, 1805. So if they, lay, if they were living today, for example, they were 116, 111 years old. What is the chance to find this woman alive? She's her sister. How old can she be? 1995, 97, I don't know. The morning after, I just pick up the phone in my way to the, to the work, to the information uh, company uh, uh, telephone in Israel, and I ask, do you have a phone of Mrs. Bracha Peretz in Hadera, Israel? They said, yes, we do have it. I wrote it. I couldn't do anything. I went, I went to the office, sat back, 
pick up the phone, call the number. The only thing I wanted to hear is one thing. The, guess what? A lady, of course, speaking Hungarian accent. That's all. And again, when I pick up the phone, a nice lady said to me in Hebrew, but with Hungarian accent, good morning, who is speaking? And I said, do I speak with Bracha parents? And she says, yes, who is speaking? And now that, how can I explain her who am I and what I want for her? This was a very difficult job. But guess what? After 10 minutes, we did the match, and she said, yes, I was living in Toshna. Everyone here knows where is Toshna. I was living in Toshna. We were 13 brother and sister and two parents. All of them murdered in Auschwitz except me. I was in Mendelez Hospital as well. I have nothing regarding written letters, books, albums, or any picture of my family. I have nothing in my world except the new family that I was created after the Holocaust. And I told to myself, amazing, I have something for her. And I explained, I have a letter for you. She said, please bring it to me. I, th I, I, was, I was afraid that she can have a heart attack. She is an old lady. I tried to find her relatives. I found her relatives after five years. And I, I gave them the following. I gave them, of course, the letter that you saw. And I gave them also a picture of Robert Moshe Polak and his wife, which is her sister. And also the passport of her sister. If you can read small letters, you can see here, sorry. So Sarah. And I went to her, I gave it to her. She, she said to me, <coughs> this woman, after 68 years only, I feel that I came back to my home. And that was, this was very strong. I decided to visit her. I visited her in Khadara. And I asked her, please, I want just one thing from me. Please give me the address of Rabbi Moshe Polak and his wife's house in Aurelia, because we are going to do a route traveling to Aurelia. And she really gave me this address of Moshe Polak and his wife. And in the tree, she is the sister of Sarah Polak. And when we went four years ago to the, and here I finish, when we went four years ago to the route traveling, and he was with me, we started in Budapest. We started the traveling in Budapest. We did Shabbat, Saturday. We spent the Saturday Shabbat in Budapest. We went to pray in the Chabad Synagogue. We pray. After the pray, we go one step, once, one level upstairs <coughs> for having the dinner, the Shabbat dinner. And in front of me, see the person, very nice one, a blonde one, with, by the way, with the armoka, with the kippah like I have. And we started speaking to We started to speak. Where are you from? I'm from Israel. I'm working here in Budapest. I have an apartment in Buda. I, some part-time in Israel, some part-time in Hungary. Uh, but where are you from? We are from Petah Pifa. What is your family name? We are the Polacks. And then he says, and then he became white. And he says, are you the Polak from the story? And I say, yes, we do. And he says, my name is Moti Peretz. I am the son of Bracha Peretz. And I ask you, please, stop for a moment the dinner and come with me to the cinema. One stairs uh, below. And then, of course, we picture it afterwards, after Shabbat. And in the synagogue, again, Hebrew here, there is a memorial for the memorial of Sarah Pollock and a family who were killed. <coughs> Thank you very much.
Mulțumesc mult, Amitai Polac, pentru această prezentare. Eu am o propunere uh, și o, o să-i spun mai târziu. De fapt, ne-am discutat despre asta. Am uh, convenit cu Centrul pentru Cultură și Art al județului Sălaș ca această prezentare să fie tradusă și în limba română. Și vom face acest lucru dacă Amitai ne va lăsa fișierele. În cel mai scurt timp uh, vom crea uh, posibilitatea de a updata această prezentare pe, pe site-urile muzeului și, de ce nu, pe site-ul oficial al, sau pe pagina oficială a primăriei Șimleu Silvaniei, a orașului Șimleu Silvaniei, de fapt. Amitai Polac, mulțumesc încă o dată, Todaraba, and I said if uh, we have the chance to get the folder al Institutului Shemolam, institut pe care am avut ocazia să-l vizitez în Israel, în a doua mea vizită. A fost momentul în care l-am cunoscut și pe cel care a inițiat acest proiect, Shemolam, rabinul uh, Abraham Krieger, și i-am transmis un gând bun, pentru că am fost de două ori acolo, am început la un moment dat o colaborare și iată că s-a materializat această colaborare. Îl invit să ne vorbească despre ceea ce înseamnă sau ce a însemnat lagărul Auschwitz, experiența din uh, acest lagăr și trupele Sonder Comando. Profesorul Gideon Greif este nu numai istoric șef, ci și specialist în tot ceea ce înseamnă Auschwitz, lagăre de concentrare și exterminare și trupele naziste. Please, profesor Gideon Greif. My, since my Romanian is not rich enough, I will deliver my lecture this time in English. Next time when I'll be here, it will be in Romanian, I promise you. Anyway, within the next 40 minutes, I'm going to explain to you about the killing process in Auschwitz, since most of the Jews in this area were murdered there, and my researchers uh, concentrate on this topic. If you have questions, please do not wait until the end of the lecture. I prefer the questions to be part of the lecture. On the, on the wall, we see already a small part of what was in 1944 Auschwitz. It was an imperium. Imperium including not one Auschwitz, but 45 Auschwitz. And when I say this, I mean the main camp in German Stammlager Auschwitz but most significantly is the place in which about 1,500,000 people, most of the Jews, were murdered, which is Birkenau. So when we speak about the biggest concentration and extermination camp in the world, we mean Birkenau, and Birkenau is a subcamp of Auschwitz, one of 44 subcamps. So the Jews of Hungary, and this area was annexed to Hungary in 1939, The Jews of Hungary reached Birkenau from May 1944, and I'm going to explain to you how they were murdered. I have to apologize that this lecture will be a little technically, but I have no choice. We deal with a factory, a big factory of death, and this area were. If you look to the right side, then, you see part of Birkenau, it's August 44, it's the climax of arrival of the Hungarian Jews. And we see here two of the four buildings of the four branches of the big factory of death. This is the installation number two. And this is its wing number three. They are identical like twins. What can we see here? We can see everything. We can see the roof of the undressing hall. We see the roof of the un underground gas chamber and the big building in which the corpse were cremated. I will return to this few minutes later. In addition, we see the roof of the barracks, but they are designed not for those who are going to be murdered soon, but for those who will become slaves. But this is the minority. The majority, this was always the procedure, 75 to 90% directly to their death. We can even see them here, the Hungarian Jews, on the way to be murdered here or here. 
and 5 to 15 percent, not more, to become slaves. Except the two big buildings here, number two and three, we have two others, number four and five, we do not see them now, they are outside the framework of the picture, so altogether the factory includes four buildings. Remember, if you have questions, ask during the lecture, there will be no part for answer questions and answers. How does this building look like from the outside? Like a very normal building, we see it in windows, doors, and this was exactly the intention, so that the sentence to death will not have any suspect, if possible, until the last minute, the last second, a normal building, but it is not exactly a normal building. It's a building into which you can enter, but never go out, at least not alive. Let me show you now the two smaller ones, number four and five. They also are twins, um, but they are not so big as the others. In order to understand how a victory of death works, let me use now a model. And we start on the left side. And in the yard of the building, you see a group of people who were sentenced to death. Who sentenced them to death? Where did it happen? It happened about one hour, one hour and a half before, on the rent of your canal. And the person who decided that these people have to die was a German physician, just a normal physician. But this time, the physician does not send his patients into the hospital or the clinic. He sends them directly to the gas chamber, the first time in the history of medicine in the world. Anyway, they have no idea, not the slightest idea, that they are going to die very soon. Now they get an order to get downstairs to a huge hall, 50 meters long. And this is the undressing hall. And the fact that we have an undressing hall in the process has made two reasons. Why? First of all, it was said that it is a bath or a shower, desinfection, inhalation, etc., etc. Of course, nothing true, but there is another reason for having such an interesting hole, which is humiliation. If you analyze the Holocaust from its beginning until the end, we always have this common denominator. The Germans always, always, with no exception, humiliated the Jews before murdering them. So humiliation is an important ingredient. And in order to reach such a huge and extreme humiliation, men and women have to address together. Men and women have to address together. They have no choice but to obey. They don't like it, they are ashamed, they are humiliated, they have to obey. In this hall, on the ground hall, <coughs> we meet for the first time slaves, the workers of this factory. Jewish prisoners who are forced, who are compelled to work here. They have a title, this group is called, is called the Special Group, or the Zonder Commando. And they themselves, those slaves, in the minute, in the second of their recruitment, are also sentenced automatically to death. So in the future, they will not be able to tell the truth. Principally, none of them should have survived. <coughs> but in this case, the Germans were not so perfect as we would expect and 80 to 100 survived Auschwitz and survived the war. My <coughs> researchers in the last 35 years are based on interviewing the last survivors of this important unit. Their testimonies are extremely important. They have no substitute. And nowadays, January, the end of no, today's February, February 1st, 2016, we still have two, the last two sort of commando survivors. One is in the United States and the other in Canada. The people who saw everything from A to Z. So we have an assembly line. It's a modern factory, an assembly line with six parts, with six stations in the process. Process number one is here at the undressing hall. It lasts about 15 to 20 minutes to undress completely. And there's other commander prisoners here are not too much busy. They help old people, mothers with a lot of children. As you know, the Jewish family at the time was very big. 12 children, 30 children, even sometimes more. And when asked what is going to happen, they usually prefer not to answer. They just go away, 
without any teacher. They prefer that way. In any case, nobody can save himself. After 20 minutes maximum, all Jews who have addressed walk a few meters, and then they reach a big door, and at the door, they turn to the right and find themselves in another underground hall, which is the guest chamber, which we are going to see now. Do you have questions about what I was telling you until now? If yes, go ahead. If no, I will continue. So here is the guest chamber, which is also underground in two of the four buildings. It's a little shorter than the other hall. The other hall is 50 meters long, and the guest chamber is about 40 meters long. And still, those who are standing there have not the slightest idea that they are going to die very soon. They think about the bath, the shower, but this is not the intention of the Germans. A car is reaching this place, standing on the roof of the guest chamber. Two so-called SS sanitaries come out with big aluminium cans. In these aluminium cans, there are small gray blue stones, a poisonous gas commercially called Cyclone A, Cyclone A, German, or Cyclone B, English. It's a gas which was invented in Germany about 30 years before the Holocaust. Uh, the irony of history, one of the inventors, one of the inventors was a Jewish chemist called Professor Fritz Haber. This was in the 20s of the last century. Anyway, Cyclone Bay, Cyclone Bay works very quickly and within six to ten minutes, not more, six to ten minutes, all up to 2,500 men, women, children, babies standing there suffocate, they can't breathe and they die painfully. Only now, realizing what is going on, what can they do? Nothing. Just scream and pray. We know from the testimonies of the Zonder Commander workers, slaves who are still in the nursing home, that the people were screaming loudly, and many religious Jews cried, Shema Israel, which means, listen, God. But as you, we all know, God was a little busy at the time and did not pray. So. So after 10 minutes, there is silence prevailing in the hall, and now a second group of Jewish slaves, a large 100 men at least, have to evacuate all the corpses which are here, one by one, in a very primitive way. Each corp is being brought to this place where there is a little elevator carrying the corpse one level upstairs. All the corpses have to be brought to this place which is now on the ground level, to the third part of the assembly line. And the third part of the assembly line is the removal <coughs> of all valuables. It means earrings, bracelets, wedding rings, gold teeth are being removed, and the hair of the women is being cut to be later used for textile industry and other purposes. After this part has been completed, a fourth group of two slaves, of soldier commando people, take the corpse and throw them into those five huge crematoria oven. Each of them has three openings, so altogether we have 15 ovens. And in the twin building, again, 15, altogether 30, eight in each of the smaller ones, so altogether we have 46 crematoria ovens. And in this was not enough. For this reason, the commander of the crematoria, SS Otto Molk, initiated the preparation of a huge pit behind crematoria 5, in which, parallel to the 46 ovens, hundreds of corpses were cremated. Questions? Remarks? I again have to apologize that such a lecture is so technical, and I really have no choice. In the ending of the building, from June 1944, the Thunder Commander prisoners were living in order to spare time. Until that time, they were living in their barracks in Birkenau in the camp. Now, in order to start their work, they just had to get downstairs and start their morning shift or their evening shift. Let's continue. Usually the Germans were not allowing any photography, but still we have some photos from 1943. Here is one of them showing the cremation hall, and you may notice what I've just mentioned. Five huge crematoria opens, each of them has three openings. So altogether we have 
50 onwards. <coughs> in 1944, an underground movement was developed in Auschwitz, Birkenau, and the Sonderkanal members were part of it. And one of their first attempts was to warn the Hungarian Jews, if you just can't escape, run away, don't come to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is not a five-star hotel, it's not a place of vacation, it's a place of death. How do you pursue the person that the place to which he's going to be sent is dangerous? The best way is to show him a picture, a photo. So clandestinely, secretly, they make some secret photos, and here is one of them. You see here the members of the Zona Commando and corps of Jewish women who have just been taken out from S. Chamber 5, which is behind the photographer. This is one of the secret photos which were smuggled out of Auschwitz and sent direction of Hungary, but unfortunately none of them ever reached Hungary. They were stuck on the way and the last station to which they have reached was uh, Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. So none of them very Jews ever saw them. And one of the other photos was this one, in which we see the same women, which later are being thrown into the pit, still alive, walking the last steps before they enter the hive, about five meters, not more. Let me show you this photo in large. They are naked, they have undressed outside, there was not enough place in the undressing hall. And these are exactly the women, the Jewish women, who are going to be guests within minutes, and then we saw the, their corpse be thrown into the pit. No questions? I'm going on. Uh, one of the few survivors of that unit, of that Sonder Commando, was a professional painter, a professional artist. His name was David Oler. You can see his signature here. And after surviving Auschwitz, after surviving the Sonder Commando, he returns to Paris, the city from which he was deported in 1943. And there, in 1945, 1946, and 1947, he makes hundreds, hundreds of drawings describing what he has seen with his own eyes. I will show you about six seven. Here the big building, which you already know. Please note the electrified barbed wire surrounding each of the four crematorium buildings. The chimney from which real fire was emerging, not only smoke. And the color of the Red Cross, uh, bringing paradoxically death with it. This is the car which brings Cyclone B into the building. David Oler, 1945. This is the arrival on the Ren of Birkenau from 1947. We see the aggressive welcome of the SS on the so-called Ren, the Neue Jüdische Rampe. Otto Moll was one of the most cruel SS men ever born. One of his hobbies, in quotes, was to throw into the pit. He has initiated living Jewish babies. He liked to do it in front of their mothers. And if the mother was not there, he threw the babies alive into the pit without the mother. Otto Moll was hanged in 1946. This is the most <coughs> primitive way in which the corpse were taken out. You see one by one. And when I talked to the last survivors of the Zoller Commando, they told me, everybody, that for them this was not anymore a baby, this was not anymore a woman, it was like this table, like the chair. They lost all their senses all their emotions they acted very technically like living robots like living machines this is these are the so-called dentists ironically here they pull out the gold teeth of the mouth and cut the women's hair they did on their 1946 and this is the cremation hall you see the corpse which had been checked all valuables have been taken out. This is the elevator bringing the corpse from the underground uh, level and throwing them into the uh, oven. Um, the Germans were very economical. And so over the three bodies, if there was in place, small babies and children were put to cremate them or be crushed by the fifth group. And the sixth group would take a few rushes and throw them into the river 
surrounding auschwitz birkenau the biggest river of Poland, the Vistula, or the Weizel. And there, as one of the survivors, Shabuk Hazan from Thessaloniki, told me, 9.30 a.m., a train with 3,500 Jews arrived to Birkenau after four hours, as if they had never born, as if the ground swallowed them, as if they never reached Auschwitz. The perfect ground, nothing remains. The only place in which the artist has not personally been, otherwise he wouldn't survive, was inside the gas chamber. And this is the only painting which he saw in his imagination. The last seconds, the Jews screaming, crying, praying, Shema Israel, this is God. But this is the place in which he has not been personally. All the others he saw with his own eyes. Here he is, the artist himself. You know that many artists like to paint, to paint themselves. He and his real prisoners, number 106,144, as you may know, only in Auschwitz, all the prisoners got their personal number tattooed, the men here at the outside, and the women right inside the part. And the dilemma, which we can clearly see here, he is hesitant. Shall I, or shall I not take the food? He is not the owner of the food. The real owner now is dying in the gas chamber, but he, the desire to live is strong. He will take the food. This was part number one of the lecture. If you have questions, go ahead. If not, I will do this. I have a question. Uh, I heard that uh, at the end of the war, they, they stopped to make the tattoos with the numbers. Not completely. Part of the late arrivals did not get the number. That's true. <coughs> but not all of them. That's true. Yes. I know that in April 44, two Slovaks Two Slovaks Jews that escaped from Auschwitz. Four Slovaks Jews. Yes, two pairs, two pairs. Verba, Wetzler, Mordovic, and uh, the And, uh, and uh, they went to Bratislava, and after in Budapest, they escaped too late and the world didn't want to uh, make an effort. But on the other hand, if Wallenberg and Lutz acted in Budapest and saved at least 100,000, it's because of this report of the Slovak brave Jews. So it had some kind of, of contribution to save. Jews. I know that um, after um, they brought in, in Switzerland and they showed at a press conference. They themselves did not come not to Switzerland, the, but the report others. reached uh, yes. the yes. Some others, yes. Correct. One of, one of uh, Romanian diplomats uh, took these uh, documents. And right. after the, uh, Europe and the world news about, uh, known about this thing, mm -hmm. and they pressed court to stop uh, Yes, the so the report of the those four Slovak, one of them was a Polish Jew, by the way, Modovic, uh, Czeslav Modovic. Anyway, the report had some effect at the end, at the end. And the fact that Svalbeck was sent to Budapest was a direct uh, outcome of this report. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Please. When you say that they were undressed because of the humiliation. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is the proof for that? Not, why not for just to take all the clothes no. because they want to no. do something no. else. No. Yeah. How do no. you come to the conclusion? This no. is because the uh, humiliation is a very important, very significant component in the 12 years of the Holocaust. From 33 to 45, you find it always. Or if I have to formulate in a different world, a dead Jew who has not been uh, humiliated before, it's not good enough. He has to be humiliated. And, and we find it every, in every step, from the beginning. But I, I think that it's, it is much more than humiliation. It's this kind of personification of a person. That's you part know, of humiliation. No, 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 no. Because when you cut the hair, mm -hmm. when you use, you know, you've been to Auschwitz, you saw the fabrics that they made from the hair. It's, it is, it is actually, and the soap. It is actually a more 
expensive uh, process then to make soap from other things or to make uh, uh, you know uh, uh, materials from other things. It was the idea of using them as materials. It was actually object objecting them, making them as objects, as the Zonda Commando says, as objects, not as human beings, or before and after they died. Man, we won't argue. Let's uh, argue that. Um, I listen. I remember what you said. Okay. I don't. So let's uh, proceed to part two of the match. <coughs> you know, historians do not have to agree about it. In 1944, and we started to talk about this, uh, an underground movement is developing in Birkenau, <coughs> and the headquarters of the Sonderkommando is a part of it. And for the uprising, which is planned for October 7, 1944, the most important thing is, of course, weapons. Without weapons, you can do nothing. And the most ideal place to get weapons is this place. This is how it looks today, very neglected. A huge place, a huge factory called Union Metallwerke, in which hundreds of Jews, men and women work. But how to get the materials, the explosives? A very brave young Jewish girl from Poland, uh, her name was Ruzia or Rosa Robota, recruits some of her best friends, dozens of young Jewish girls, and they are ready to smuggle out of the work every day after work some kilograms of some grams, milligrams of explosives over their body and they know that one day they will pay a very high price for it and they did. One of them was Ala Gerner <coughs> and the other was Esther or Estusha Weissblum and after the revolt which takes place as I mentioned on uh, Saturday of October 7th 1944 <coughs> Four of those brave Jewish girls will be hanged publicly. The hanging took place on January 6, 1945. It is the last public hanging taking place in Auschwitz, Berlin. What happened during the five or six hours of the uprising? We do not know a lot. I just would like to remind you that the uprising in Auschwitz, Birkenau is not the first uprising of Jews in the extermination camps. We had two before. You certainly know, Trevitka, August 2nd, 1943, and two months later in Sobibor on October 14th, 1944. And the uprising in Auschwitz is the third on October 44. We know that three SS guards were killed. We know their names. If you look here, you see them here. And as usually, they get a higher rank after their death. Crematoria 4 was burnt or exploded. We do not know until they what really happened. But the price the Soviet commando men paid was extremely high. 451 members of the Soviet commando died on that day, and 200 others died in the next two weeks. I forgot to mention to show you how big this factory of death becomes. <coughs> when it was created in 1940, there were six members, six, that's all. When the Hungarian Jews reached Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1944, spring summer, the number of the workers, of the slaves in the factory, <coughs> reaches 1,000, from 6 to 1,000. It's a huge factory. So 451 are going to be killed during the uprising. The uprising already was published in Poland through the underground movement. Here is one of the reports. And even in one secret, I think you will not be able to read this text. I can also, because it's in the coded letters. So the report about the Auschwitz uprising of the Sonder Commando was spread immediately and known in the whole world. And I'd like to say something about this important scripts or scrolls of Auschwitz, which were written by members of the Sonder Commando, mostly in Yiddish and Polish. <coughs> Most of them are still buried in the grounds of Birkenau, about 90%. Only 10 have been uh, discovered. And these, according to my uh, appreciation at least, are the most important documents of the Holocaust. <coughs> the texts written by members of the Sonder Commando or called the Scrolls of Auschwitz, describing their inner life, describing the preparations for the uprising, 
and describing the cruelty of the Germans. Only 10%, but it's a really precious document. How much time do we still have, Daniel? Yeah. Not here. Okay. So I guess I have five to ten minutes more. Questions, please. Go ahead. I would like to answer your questions. In these Zonder Commandos, there were only Jews. Mostly. I would say 96% Jews, the others, not many, Poles and Russians. There was a small group of Russian non Jewish prisoners who were brought from Maidanek, and they were not Jews. And all of them were, most of them were killed during the operation. But it's a Jewish commander, a Jewish working in this school, 96%. Go on. Other you have the names of all of them? We have many names, not all the names. It is impossible to reconstruct all the names. 1,000 people. And there were no lists. <coughs> As I mentioned, when I started the project in 1986, there were still 31 Zonder Commando prisoners alive all over the world, in Israel and other countries. And now, beginning of February 19, 2016, there are only two very old men, 96, 97 years old. And when they will die, we will have nobody to tell us all the details. But I did an effort, a special effort, to interview all of them, and I published it already in two books. And the third is in preparation, in order to leave very important testimonies for uh, the future. The book is called We Wept Without Tears, and this was a question, an answer I got for a question when I asked one of the Soviet Commando <coughs> members, uh, Mr. Gabay, Jacob Gabay, tell me, did you ever cry there? And he answered, yes, we did, but without tears. Because in such a tragic place, no tears are significant anymore. You can't cry every day. What were the appreciation, the opinion of the other camp? Thank you. It's a very important question. <coughs> or in testimonies given by other survivors of Auschwitz, Jews and not Jews, the image of the Sonder Commando prisoners was very negative, very negative. They were accused of being collaborators, even murderers, although they didn't kill even one person. The killing was always, without exception, being perpetrated by the Germans, never by the prisoners. But still they were accused of being collaborators and murderers, and one of my goals was to ameliorate, to improve their image. And I have to say that I succeeded. Nowadays, you can't hear even one voice accusing them of being collaborators or murderers. They were good people trying to help the Jews in the last minutes. Let, let me give you one example, only one. One of the survivors, Yosef Zakar, told me he was in the undressing hall. Hundreds of women undressed before his eyes. If he wants, he can look. If he doesn't, he doesn't have to look. And in order to spare additional humiliation from these women naked, to look always to the other side, not to embarrass them more. Than Just one example of humanity in that place, which was so unhumane. More questions? So the uprising was uh, a success, uh, in addition to the others in Sobibor and Trebinka, but this is the end of Auschwitz, no Jews more to murder, and on the night between January 17th and January 18th, Auschwitz is evacuated, about 70,000 prisoners leave it, many of them will be murdered on the way by the guards, those who can't walk quickly enough, and the Soviet command of people who still were alive mingled among those walking for the so-called death marches, and all of them survived. All of them survived. After the war, they tried to establish a new life, a new chapter in their life. They create families, they have children. And my impression, although I'm a historian and not a psychologist, my impression is that their children, the second, the third generation, they pay the high price. They suffer even more than their fathers, 
because of the story which never was told. Thank you so much they, for listening. They told, uh, they told uh, their the children? No, they did not. The story was somehow in the air. And without even telling it, it was there. <coughs> That's the reason I'm saying that the children, they pay the highest price. The so-called syndrome of the second and third generation. Thank you for listening to me.